Please Thank give you. them a hand. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's a, a pleasure to be here in, in Des Moines, Iowa. Um, I feel like I'm coming home. I'm, I'm a Southern Illinois boy, so I'm familiar with uh, corn and pigs. And uh, I knew I was home when I had, uh, I enjoyed quesadillas in your restaurant last night, and they came with pork in them, <laughs> in addition to just cheese. And uh, also, as Jeff has enlightened us, I was happy to find out that the uh, your Iowa pigs are actually in their poop as, as a health poop sort. It can't. That's how you. So my background, as Jeff alluded to, was uh, in neurophysiology. I took a doctorate in that and went to med school. Uh, started out, did neurology residency training partially a couple of years of that, finished my residency in family medicine, became board certified in that. Uh, so I, I got to know people in the real world, uh, although I had a strong neurological background. <clears throat> um, I ended up uh, delivering over 600 babies over the course of 10 years. I've never lost a mother or a child, I'm proud of that fact. And, um, but it turned out that many of these children had neurobehavioral conditions. And I found myself using my neurology again. And I, I gradually, um, there was such a need for that, as you all know, in the mental health field and in the brain injury field and anything that's wrong with the brain, there aren't many people that are comfortable uh, dealing with the brain. The brain is a daunting organism. Uh, and, and so to have had training in that, specifically in, in my doctoral work prior to medical school, I was comfortable with the brain. And I really came to realize something that we all know now, that, that the, uh, the mind is what the brain does. Uh, so mind and brain, the brain, everything lives as this has its organic basis in, in the brain. So um, as I got more difficult behavioral patients, my practice grew. Fortunately, uh, I was able to, uh, I, I moved on, and I was able to become nuclear certified and perform brain spec imaging. We'll show some of those today. And it was in that work that drew me into the brain injury arena, where I've been involved uh, with brain injury patients, presenting brain injury seminars, particularly on the use of SPECT. Uh, one of my other side jobs that I've had along the way is advocating for brain injured patients in the legal setting. I'm happy to report that the SPECT scans, as, as I have all over questioned in some quarters, but as performed by a facility that I work with, and, uh, started a serious scan facility. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to report that we were able to get all 150 scans admitted as evidence before a jury and for 150 patients over the past 15 years and with awards approaching $200 million for their benefits. So that's just something I do on the side. Um, and uh, in 2010, I certified as a brain injury specialist. So, so uh, the brain is, uh, is where I live now. Currently, I am the medical director of the Inlight Medical Corporation that, that uh, manufactures one of the cutting edge uh, products that you're going to be hearing about uh, today, uh, phototherapy and use of light, uh, which was previously in the alternative medicine realm. But as you'll see in my talk, hopefully, that it's uh, gaining more widespread acceptance. As a practitioner, um, I was one of those uh, providers that was afflicted with listening to my patients. And uh, there was a big part in the I enjoy Jeff's diagram of including listening to the patient. You know, hopefully that will never go out of your orange circle. That should always be in there. You can't just go by studies all along. You have to listen to all the cultural, personal values. But in my family practice, uh, and, and I, as I mentioned to you, I, I learned, I was trained in obstetrics uh, at Rose Hospital in Denver, Colorado, you may know it. At the time I trained there, they were the number one, had the number one perinatal mortality statistics in the country. One of the reasons was the professors there had used a device called a Celastic Vacuum Extractor uh, instead of forceps. And I trained on the use of that as a resident. <coughs> And when I ended up uh, 
starting my private practice in the Seattle area. I went to the local hospital when I, when I was delivering uh, with my first baby, and uh, I said, I need this elastic vacuum extractor. I said, what is that? <laughs> and I said, well, it's this thing, you know. What's the proof? What's the evidence, you know? Yeah, yeah, well, the evidence is a bunch of really good people that had the best results in the country taught me how to do it, so I want it. Anyway, uh, to make a long story short, uh, there was a lot of resistance against doing something new that had scientific evidence for the doctor's training and had, had published a paper or two. Uh, maybe it wasn't necessarily randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled uh, for a quality, but it was based on not only personal experience but scientific evidence. So I fought that battle. The next thing you know, the child's born and it's a boy and they want a circumcision. Well, I was one of the first to actually find out that circumcisions hurt if you don't use the anesthetic. And then babies cry. And so I was one of the first. There was a, an article on uh, the use of local anesthetic during, anest during circumcisions, and I was one of the first to do that. Oh my gosh, the uproar from the pediatrician, you can't do that. I said, why not? Well, we don't do that. You know, what do you mean? We don't do that. I said, I do that. And it works really well. And anyway, so I fought that battle. The next thing you know, as I described it in neural behavioral practice, I had a lot of ADD kids, and I had some Asperger's and developmental delay, and traumatic brain injury, yada yada. And I began learning about this new technology called SPECT imaging, where you looked at functional studies of the brain, not just, you know, we're going to go through this. And of course, I began doing that. My practice grew and grew, and I got on the Dr. Phil show, and it was a big deal, you know. And I could tell bipolar kids from ADD kids, and it was this thing was a wonderful thing. The local psychiatrist, you can't do that. You can't do that. The old Chinese proverb says, the person who says it cannot be done should not interrupt the person already doing it. And so, and so it's with this that I say, so we're now up here today to tell you my, on my new on my new mission uh, is with light therapy for brain injury. And, and and I all of you working in the field, I know what you come up against. And I would point out this quote from Albert Einstein: "The great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds." So, if you haven't experienced pushback from your efforts to help your patients with something new or different or culturally based or based on a patient preference, um, I, I would encourage you to remain strong and steadfast. And with regard to what I'm going to tell you about today, I hope to provide some evidence uh, for you that it's real. Okay, I'm going to review some, some really basic, we have some basic information about uh, traumatic brain injury also it, it relates to acquired brain injury. I know we use the term acquired brain injury and along the way I did get involved with carbon monoxide as an acquired injury. I wrote a chapter in the medical textbook on that. But we're going to focus on, you remember in 2003, uh, the CDC wrote a report to Congress that says, you know what, we may have a silent epidemic on our hands, maybe. This was in 2003, now 15 years ago. And and but what we found out, and the estimates at that time were something like one and a half million uh, TBIs per year. Um, but studies uh, came out that says that really this is an underestimate, and recent studies show 2.8 million, and you may see another study, there's another study that shows it's actually 3.8 million uh, new traumatic brain injuries every year, of which 80 some percent are of the mild category. <coughs> So, and um, a reality check on this data is very important because in the, in case, in the case of, obviously we know what happens with severe TBI and moderate to severe TBI, but no one questions uh, those diagnoses, so no one questions the fact that those individuals have disabilities that are, are quantifiable. The milder TBIs sometimes get questioned, and there are studies that show that by McAllister and others, that at least 10%, in some studies it's 20% of individuals with mild traumatic brain injuries will go on to develop permanent brain injury. 
And certainly we're seeing that in the sports field today. It's public knowledge that, you know, headers and football and soccer and hockey and some of the contact sports, uh, some of the milder t bats concussions, getting your bell rung, are generally, some 90% of them will resolve spontaneously, but 10% will not. And if you do the math on how many people actually get a TBI, 10% uh, and how many are mild, if I can get this one. Anyway, you can read this. That there's, a, of the individuals with mild TBI each year, if 10% of them go on to develop permanent brain injury, that's like 400,000 new people every year. It's a lot of people. Um, and so the point is there's a lot of uh, people that are in the miserable minority. Can I use this to advance? We don't have to come back. Use that arrow to advance. Okay. Thanks. Just a definition of my, uh, just, I know again, Many of you know all this, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same playing field because we do have new attendees. A mild traumatic brain injury is any, and by the way, this is a definition from the 1993 Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine, which was assumed by the 2009 World Health Organization. It's still in effect. Any period of observed or reported transient confusion, disorientation, or impaired, or impaired consciousness of under 30 minutes. A common phrase you hear is I was dazed or I was confused. Uh, getting a go wrong in football practice or getting rear-ended and just kind of stumbling around being dazed and confused uh, or any period of memory that around the time of the injury lasting less than 24 hours and obviously if you get other more serious signs such as uh, headaches, uh, vomiting, dizziness uh, and uh, our seizure activity. But the point of this slide is, and I think you know this, uh, number one, you don't have to lose consciousness to sustain a, a brain injury, either acquired or traumatic, not, not at least a mild traumatic brain injury. And um, you don't have to lose consciousness, nor do you have to hit your head. This could be an acceleration deceleration injury, such as a whiplash, in which the brain is thrown against uh, the skull. Um, after your TBI, assuming you get it, we just went over the definitions of post-concussion syndrome, just to review. Uh, there's two different criteria. One is the ICD-10 code, in which you, you need to have three of those eight symptoms of headache, dizziness, fatigue, irritability, sleep disturbance, concentration, memory, or uh, problems tolerating stress. Uh, the DSM-4, uh, was, which is somewhat outdated, but is still in clinical use in terms of the term post-concussive syndrome. Uh, it's the first five. They drop off concentration of memory and stress tolerance, but add affective changes, personality, uh, apathy, and depression. So they add sort of the mood component as you would expect from the psych psychiatrist. The post-concussion syndrome timeline uh, can be looks like this. Basically, if someone uh, sustains a mild traumatic brain injury and they go to their doctor or they go to the emergency room, they are and they didn't have, they may not have been knocked out. Their period of uh, consciousness or alteration in, in their state of consciousness was less than 30 minutes. They are correctly told that you know, pat on the head. They'll get a CT scan, maybe, maybe not. Their pat on the head and say, go home it'll go away and uh, call your, see your doctor in a week. And that's generally true because 90% of mild TBIs do resolve. Unfortunately, 10% or so will fall into the PPCS, which is the Fit Persistent Post-Concussive Syndrome. And these are the individuals, when you scan them and look at those in a little bit, you'll actually find evidence of organic brain damage in these individuals. Uh, Aaron Bigler, uh, many of you that work in this field, I'm sure heard of Aaron Bigler, sort of the silverback gorilla of the field, uh, world-renowned uh, expert on traumatic brain injury. That's got a really nice uh, diagram in which he shows basically um, that this is age as you get older here on the x-axis, and there's a what we call a dementia threshold here, which basically says if you live long enough, 
and you start off with this amount of cognitive reserve. If you live long enough, over time, you will you will cross this line and you will be demented. So the good news with healthcare is we live longer, we have an increasing chance of becoming demented. <laughs> which, uh, which I guess it's not bad. If you live to be 110 or 20, you know, we've had a good life. It's maybe time to be demented. Um, <laughs> Um, now, if you sustain a traumatic brain injury, what you do is you dip into your bank account, you dip into your cognitive reserve, you know, acutely, and then you recover to some degree. And this is where we all come in. We want this recovery to get closer up to this line. If you don't have a complete recovery, you will switch to a different trajectory, which basically says, and the studies show, that you have an increased likelihood of developing dementia at an earlier age here. And again, uh, the older you are when this happens, the worse this is. So um, that's just kind of a, a timeline, a visual on the natural progression. Okay, now we're gonna switch to, I'm gonna use this, um, this is an actual case. This is my first case in which I, uh, this was in 2003 of a woman that was involved in a motor vehicle accident. She sustained a traumatic brain injury. She had a transient loss of consciousness and at the minimum uh, had an alteration in her state of consciousness. Uh, her car was totaled. She was taken to an emergency room, uh, which is appropriate care and on the first day. She got a CT scan. Getting a CT scan on the day of injury is totally appropriate. You look for skull fractures, you look for bleeding, you look for possible life-threatening things, and it was negative. And she was told that, um, as shown in the previous slide, go home, you'll be fine. Um, call your doctor if you're not fine, and you'll be better in a, a month or two. Well, it turns out she wasn't. And six to nine months later, she was still having headaches and dizziness and uh, a lot of symptoms of post-concussive syndrome. She was basically technically in the persistent post-concussive syndrome phase. Presented, was referred to a neurologist who got an MRI, and that was negative. And unfortunately, not knowing the science that existed at the time, the, this neurologist told this woman that, quote, there's nothing wrong with you. Nothing wrong with you. So this lady languished for the next two years uh, with, and she lost her job. She became essentially disabled and her neuropsychological testing was abnormal. She got some standardized treatments uh, and got a little bit better. She got an antidepressants, of course, and stimulants and for focusing and, and the usual cognitive behavioral and neurocognitive rehab programs, but she just wasn't progressing. And then finally, uh, as it turns out, an attorney who read about this, as this happens sometimes, uh, advocating, she, she saw she was talking to this attorney about her, her legal case of the collision. And this attorney had read about the SPEC technology. And she came in and we performed. She was referred by her doctor. We did a SPEC scan. Now on this image, this was like real primitive color scales. We don't use this anymore. But what this indicates on this, this scan, which was done about two years after the accident, wherever you see red, this is a blood flow pattern. Basically what SPEC is, is a functional study of the brain. Um, we look not at the structure. CT and MRI just tell you, are your brain cells there? Are they dead or alive? Are your, is your skull fracture? Are there masses of blood in there? Are there tumors there? But they cannot tell you how each individual's brain cell is, is actually working. A SPEC scan looks at regional differences in blood flow. And we'll show you later the underlying uh, mechanism that's based on some of the interventions that we're doing at Enlight is based on the metabolism on the cell. So it turns out wherever you see yellow, there was a 95% chance that her blood flow was lower than normal. Wherever the, the uh, images depict green, that was 97%, and the blue was 99%. So there were significant broad areas of hypofunctioning brain cells, which did show up on our neuropsychological testing. But over the years, I found really good correlation with the uh, neuropsychological screening test in terms of the areas of the brain involved 
and also what we end up seeing on the imaging, on the functional imaging. So this lady had objective evidence of organic brain damage. Now, so we're going to start doing a deep dive. We're going to dive from the phenomenal discussions on the, on the phenomenological level of, you know, what's the TBI, what happens, what's the imaging look like, what are the patient's symptoms, when should they do better, blah, blah, blah. Here's, what we, here's the question that this slide asks us. What is going on? But doesn't that make you want to ask that question? Why is this woman with a normal CAT scan, a normal MRI, why is her blood flow and her circulation decreased? It turns out, as most of you know, and if you don't know, I'll share with you, brain blood flow, like many other areas of the body, is auto-regulated. That means if the brain cells are working, they will draw blood to them. I'll come over to this side for a while. I don't want to ignore you on the, on the right here. <clears throat> it means that your, breath, your brain cells are not metabolizing. The analogy would be a muscle. If you've got your muscle as we're all sitting here right now, there's a certain amount of blood flow in each of our muscles. If we begin exercising, what happens? The blood flow increases. Why does it do that? Because exercising muscles are metabolizing and they're using glucose and they're creating lactic acid buildup in the muscle, carbon dioxide builds up. These substances are triggers to dilate the blood vessels to bring more oxygen. It's a, it's a, a cool, neat little circle. It's like, oh, you need more? Well, we'll give you more. You just send us a signal. Okay, so what the spec scan implies <coughs> is that the brain cells were not metabolizing properly. So what's going on with those brain cells following an injury? This is, I just threw this slide in to show you just a brief uh, side and then I guess as a reminder to myself to point out that the brain, that the blood flow to the brain is primarily 80% of it goes to the gray matter. And so this indicates gray matter damage. We also know with the new diffusion tensor imaging that we can have white matter uh, axon shearing uh, of axons is another way to evaluate the presence or absence of a brain injury that is not always apparent on a standard CAT scan. Okay, I just throw this in, and I think all of you working in the field are aware that um, the brain controls more than thinking. I have so many brain injured patients that I've advocated for that end up getting neuropsychological testing and guess what else they find? What are some of the other things they find? The neuropsychologists. Depression, anxiety, personality changes, mood disturbances, as well as memory and concentration, personality, and we see hormonal changes. How many of you have seen your patients after traumatic brain injuries experience hormonal difficulties. Uh, it happens because the hypothalamus is there. It's gray matter structure. It has a lot of uh, cardiotropin releasing factors and thyrotropin releasing factors. So there's a lot of hormonal <coughs> dysregulation that can happen with the TBI. Um, I just want to throw that in but because we typically think of you know, getting a TBI as having cognitive difficulties and memory problems. And so you go to the neuropsychologist and what do they say? You know, yes, the person has cognitive problems, but you know, they're also depressed. And the only reason they can't think is because they're depressed. If they simply weren't depressed, they'd be fine. And you know, uh, that's, they have a lot of personal problems and it's just the patient's depression that's causing them not to think. Well, it turns out that Mood and uh, mood difficulties are a direct cause of traumatic brain injury. In other words, it's not a, instead of it's a it's an add-on problem that is when you injure your brain, you are injuring more than just focusing and thinking and concentration. You are you are damaging your emotional regulation centers too. And studies evidence-based studies, peer-reviewed, published, 
have shown by Borsche as early as 2004, and there are many of them since then, and fan, fan in 2004, a two to three fold inc increase incidence of depression and anxiety in six months following a mild TBI in otherwise non-depressed people. And uh, we, we have evidence on our, our scans of actually of, of showing this. So I want to dive down deeper. So we've looked at the of what a TBI is, we looked at post-concussive syndrome, we looked, we realized in the milder cases of, of brain injury that they may not be apparent on CTs and MRIs. And so we need to ask more questions, um, <coughs> like get a functional study maybe and see what you see. And so now one of the things we're learning is that researchers at UCLA and other places at Harvard have shown that brain injury is not a single event, but it's a trigger for a cascade of events that is now considered a disease process. Um, in an article by Aaron Bigler in 2013, he shows serial CAT scans, which actually show progressive development after a single event of uh, actual CAT scan abnormalities and, and brain atrophy. But it's a compl complex disease process that unfolds over time. Uh, it's not a single event. Uh, the word dispersed is no longer applies. We've all seen this on our patients, haven't we? They're kind of bad to begin with, but if they have a brain injury, that they may get worse over time. And there are several things going on with neuroinflammation and cell death, apoptosis, is associated with progression of symptoms of TBI. And of course, these injuries are, as you know, invisible. Invisible. My job in advocating for patients and treating in person, dealing with them personally, but then if I get invited to their legal process, advocating for, for them is showing a picture to the jury that it's, that it's a real phenomenon. That's what the imaging allows us to do. And so they're, they're injury is invisible, but some of these imaging modalities can make it visible. I don't want to, there won't be a quiz on this afterwards, but this is a, a summary of some of the metabolic changes that happen immediately after traumatic brain injury. You see changes in fluxes of uh, potassium and sodium. You see a huge influx of calcium into the cell. This is the point I want you to, uh, Oh, I went back what you see here, one of the main uh, is an influx of calcium into the cell. This is very important, and this underlies the pathophysiology of the intervention that I, that we, that, that Jody and I and our company are now employing, and having good results. So. Um, let's take a look at what actually happens following TBI in an animal model where you can actually, uh, poor rats, you know, they get subjected to a lot of things. We give them a standardized uh, brain injury and then we uh, chop their heads off and homogenize them and we look at, and see stuff. So let's take a look and see what we see on the cellular level. This is not a Picasso. This is actually uh, an image of a uh, part of the vascular injury, there's two primary injuries that happen with the TBI, the vascular injury and, and axonal injury. Um, this is the wall of the blood vessel right here. And so this is where blood goes. This is the blood brain barrier, that tiny skinny black line you see there. Um, and I don't know if I can see it on this side. I'll come over here and show you. There's a tiny little skinny black line right here, that's the glial limitans. That is the world famous blood brain barrier. Uh, here's a new word for you to impress your friends and colleagues with. Neurovascular unit, that is the latest proper phase of the blood brain barrier. <coughs> At any rate, what you see here is something that doesn't belong. And that is, this E stands for erythrocyte. That is a red blood cell. It's not over here where it belongs. It's over here. And this is 
and astrocyte foot process, so this is the brain cell, and around it you see all this inflammation. And I think you probably know that blood is a very irritating substance. Uh, if, it gets, if it gets into places in the body where it doesn't belong, it can in initiate a neuroinflammatory response. So we're seeing a lot of neuroinflammation from this vascular injury with the red blood cell having extravasated out where it belongs to the blood vessels get stretched and the blood-brain barrier gets compromised and things get in against the brain that don't belong there. Can you see that on a CAT scan? How do you want to see it? You can't see that. Oh, this results in something you can see. And we're going to keep going. Next. Here is our friend, the mitochondria up here. And it's aimed to detect calcium. And all those little black dots in there is calcium on the mitochondria, which is the energy factory of the cell. So you get this event, you get this neurometabolic cascade, you get all that calcium going into your mitochondria. Guess what? The brain cells cannot manufacture ATP. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they die, but they can't, they kind of lose their charge. One of the things that brain cells do, they're essentially tiny little batteries. It, as we sit here right now, they're consuming 20% of our calories, okay? Because it's the most highly energy dependent organ in the body. And so it takes a lot of energy to move that the sodium out and that potassium in to create that electrical membrane potential, which allows the brain cells to do what brain cells do, conduct electricity. And depending on what part of the brain it's in, if, it's, if you're like, if you're a brain cell in the frontal lobe, your, your job is to conduct electricity with regard to focusing. That's your job. If you're a brain cell in the hippocampus on the temporal lobe, as a lot of you know this, I'm sure, and your job is to conduct electrical impulses related to memory, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, depending on the part of the brain that you're in. So you see pathophysiologically at the cellular level what's going on. This is an axon. This is normal sodium potassium pump staining. And when that axon gets stretched, look how that's disrupted as well. So there are, there are metabolic changes that go on that aren't gross blood. It's not a skull fracture. It's not a big hunk of blood sitting in there. But there's stuff going on at the cellular level. So knowing this, this, that we do now from these studies, but what do we do about it? We have an intervention. We have a lot of um, clinical interventions, which are all good. This is, this, the, the, the technology that I'm going to talk about now doesn't, isn't intended to replace anything that anybody does, but it's intended also to be considered as a potential add-on. What if we could put a lightning bolt or something electrical or photonic through the skull onto the brain cell and get it to go down into the mitochondria, which is here, and knock all that calcium off? Don't do this on the other side. Here's the skull. Here is, turns out, photonic energy from light therapy concentrated uh, photo biomodulation, which we'll talk about, which we'll talk about in a minute, goes down, knocks the calcium off of the mitochondria, and guess what? Releases nitric oxide. Oops. It releases nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is the body's miracle molecule. A Nobel Prize in 1998 was awarded for it as an intracellular signaling molecule. <clears throat> and it does two things. One, it does several things. But one of the things that it does is it causes vasodilation. We'll see that in a slide better. <coughs> but it, it won the Nobel Prize for being an intracellular signaling molecule. A secondary messenger. 
It goes to the nucleus of the cell. And there, magically, the cells in our body seem to innately know what's wrong with them, and it triggers the manufacture of anti-inflammatory substances, analgesic substances, brain-derived neuro brain neurotrophic factors, and other healing substances. This is a uh, study uh, basically showing that uh, on animals showing a model of traumatic brain injury showing in animals how it can penetrate, how light therapy can penetrate the skull and result in improved uh, changes. A little bit complicated, but on this left axis you have neurological severity score and the two groups of rats. The black dots are rats that didn't get any light therapy and the white dots did and this is time and they got they got one treatment of light therapy four hours after their traumatic brain injury and they measured their neurological severity score and you can see that over time the the uh, light the rats that were treated did much better than the rats that weren't treated the rats that weren't treated slowly healed but the ones that uh, got the light therapy um, healed even better Oops. Yeah. the laser in the forward are right next to each other and in another part of that study they gave the light therapy for three days and in 28 days seven days later here and 28 days later here they showed increased neurogenesis that is new brain cells new brain cells and they showed increased synaptogenesis increased synapses from the light therapy. And this is a study that simply from Harvard that proves that light does penetrate the skull uh, at about maybe between about three and 10% of the light does get through the skull. So people ask the question, how can light go through the skull? You can get through the skull of rats, but it can't get through in humans. This is a study of humans that showed that light did penetrate the skull. And we did other scientific studies that showed uh, ear uh, emitting <coughs> ear infrared light on the surface and then peeling away different layers of the skin. This was in vivo. This was during a, a surgical procedure. <coughs> during the surgical procedure, they shine light here on the surface of the brain from this uh, emitter. And this was the detector here. And as they peeled it away, the detector went down to make long story short, they basically found obviously as you uh, peel down less light from on the, on the top, when the two things were on the, the emitter and the detector on the surface, they could detect all of it. But when they got down to the surface of the brain, 3% of the light did get through. So, three, so light therapy does penetrate the cell. And I'm just gonna, this is another study that shows the same thing. And I'm going to segue into Jody here uh, to wrap up quickly. But this process is called photobiomodulation. Um, and there are numerous peer reviewed studies out there on this now in which red and near infrared light penetrate the skull. They impact the mitochondria to release nitric oxide and increase ATP. The ATP goes to restoring the membrane potential and the nitric oxide triggers the nucleus to manufacture, uh, you've heard of the BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factors, and all sorts of other factors that help restore brain health. And I think with that, I'll hand things over to Jody. So that's the deep dive from the TBI to the symptoms, to the diagnosis, to the imaging, the circulation problems, why and what's going on at the cellular level, this calcium, and a way to address the mitochondrial dysfunction. And Doc will be back to explain some of the clinical studies that we're engaged in and a little bit more, quite a bit more actually, about the SPECT imaging. But um, you're a tough act to follow, so here I am. I am a nurse practitioner. I've been in this in the nursing industry for, for nigh over, well, right on 20 years right now. But I began my journey into health and healing as a naturopath and studies there. And it's been my commitment over these past 20 years to figure out how to 
build the bridges between the two worlds because it became very clear to me that the worlds were divided, the medical world and the natural health paradigm. And so what I've found over the course of my years in the industry, well, in the medical industry, is that light therapy happens to be one of those medical device bridges. And that's, that's what we're hoping to uh, report to you today. But as a good nurse, what I needed to do was to get granular. I needed to get into the evidence. I needed to understand light therapy. And I've been in the industry now for over seven years, only one year uh, full time. But I had to understand how would, here's the common question, why doesn't my doctor know about light therapy, right? I needed to understand as a, as a clinician how I neither did I know about this therapy called light therapy. And so I did some homework. And as it turns out, and if you did some history fact-checking on, on, on the subject, you'd learn as well. We've been using light therapy as a humanity, as a people, for thousands of years. This is not rocket science, and it is not new. Back in the ancient Egyptian, times of ancient Egypt, there were temples built with particular um, window openings and color um, um, filaments hung in front of the window so that literally different colors would be shown upon the human body that was there to be healed by their healers so, because they understood intuitively that color was essential for health. They understood intuitively that light is an essential nutrient. Without light, what happens? Just ask my basil plant. I mean, it was doing beautifully outside and then the winter came upon us in the fall and I brought it in and I set it next to this wonderful window. It failed to survive my transition or that transition because it wasn't getting enough light. Okay, so we know this. We know that light is essential for health. And what's happened then over the centuries, over the millennia, did I forward? Uh, what's happened is that we have dove deeply into the science. You know, we have Descartes that, that discovered or announced the theory of light. We have Max Planck that talked about lights being photons, actually giving the name photon to the word light. Those, those elements from the sun that could be uh, captured, not captured, but identified. There's been a naming game going on for thousands of years. In, 2000, or in 1903, this gentleman, Niels Feinson, actually received the Nobel Prize for his light therapy treatment for a lupus disorder, right? So it began being acknowledged by the American Medical Association as early as the early 1900s. And then we move forward. And what's happened over time is that once NASA got a hold of the notion that light therapy was essential and would be essential for the health of our astronauts, millions and millions of dollars started being poured into the research. We now have over 5,000, which isn't a large number, but it's a lot larger than it was when I started my look-see into the evidence base of light therapy, which about seven years ago, I can tell, well, about six is when I really started looking into the evidence. There were fewer than, well, there were nearer to 3,200 clinical studies in the National Institute of Health database. Now, just recently, we broke the 5,000 peer-reviewed studies published and located at the NIH.gov website. So it's pubmed.gov, for those of you that aren't familiar, pubmed.gov. So over 5,000 thousand peer-reviewed published studies, 17 international journeys, 735 textbooks, which by the way, Doc, I, I have a challenge for you. We, my nephew's in physical therapy school right now and he sent me home over the holidays with his textbook and I read the chapter on light therapy. We've got work to do. We need to rewrite that chapter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's great. I mean, it's great. We're at the beginning. Our medical books 
do not have light therapy incorporated in them. Our medical training does not. My nursing training does not as yet. Nursing education, to my knowledge, does not incorporate the evidence that's provided about light therapy as a therapeutic intervention. We're just at the beginning, but we cannot wait. Just like Jeff said, you can't wait. <coughs> Use your common sense. Listen to what we're sharing with you today and see if it might fit for you. For some of you it will, for some it will not. And that's fine. You'll catch on later. You'll come later. The early adopters, you're going to run to the front of the room at the end of the presentation. So what is light therapy? Polychromatic light therapy, very simple by definition, means the application of two or more colors simultaneously. Big word, polychromatic, more than one color. Polychromatic light therapy is the application of two or more colors via light emitting diode technology at the same time. There are other keywords, and, and actually it was just in 2016 where the keyword photobiomodulation was adopted as the medical science heading for the NIH. Prior to that it was low-level laser therapy, then, then altered to um, include low-level light therapy, but L L L T is a keyword, four-letter keyword that you'll want to use when searching the for yourself for yourself, the evidence that lives in the National Institute of Health database. But only recently was the, was the uh, uh, phraseology photobiomodulation added, and that's because it speaks specifically to the process that happens at the cellular level, as Doc was saying, um, um, when light is applied directly to the skin. All right. Now, the Nobel Prize Doc alluded to uh, was for, in, in medicine and physiology, for the discovery of nitric oxide, that single mole molecule, as a signaling molecule for the cardiovascular system. And why that's important in the conversation about light therapy is that light therapy actually triggers the release of nitric oxide from the mitochondria, that energy machine within our every cell and those many mitochondria, that that creates our, our fuel, our ATP, it triggers the release of nitric oxide from the molecule or from the uh, mitochondria. Now, what does that mean in plain English? What that means is the mitochondria is available to make ATP. In those brain injured cells, many of them are not dead. Now, many of the brain injured cells are not dead, but they have, like Doc said, reduced their metabolic process. They've reduced their demand for energy They've in, in the effort to survive. And when, you can, when we can with light therapy, which does penetrate the skull, and that's been an accumulation of over 20 years worth of research to prove that it does penetrate the skull, cell, or excuse me, the skull, when it penetrates the skull and activates the mitochondria within the brain matter, what's happening here is nitric oxide is released and one of its key functions most notable functions based on the Nobel Prize is vasodilation. The blood vessels relax, which means there's a call for, or there's the avenue for more circulation into the brain. And when you bring more circulation to the brain, what you're doing is providing the, the necessary ingredients for tissue repair. Now think about it. Why is it that exercise and physical therapy is an essential part of stroke recovery and brain injury recovery? Why is that? Sure, exercise is good and it makes the muscles strong, but fundamentally it's about promoting circulation and in particular promoting circulation to the brain. Why is it that aerobic exercise is so valuable whether you're uh, recovering from brain injury or not? It's in part because it sends circulation and all of those vital nutrients to our brain, which as Doc so eloquently said, handles more than just our thought processes. Right? So it is key, it is essential in any of your recovery efforts to increase circulation to the brain. Excuse me. So, 
I just saw the hook coming from the side. I'll speed it up a bit. Here is the process by which light therapy increases, triggers the actual um, um, uh, mitochondria, releasing that nitric oxide, which is the signaling molecule not only for the increase of circulation, but also for the production of healing substances. The analgesics right? The anti-inflammatories, glutathione, growth factors. What happens when you trigger the release of nitric oxide, when you bathe the brain cells in photon energy, is that the natural healing processes of the body, of the brain, are triggered. You see, there's no magic here in the device. There's no magic here in the device. The magic lives within us, our innate ability to heal. Now that in and of itself is a tough concept for people to take in, but I remind you of the simple healing process that happens with a, a paper cut. You, you do absolutely nothing and the skin heals. When the child falls and scrapes the knee and all of that tissue is red and a little bit bloody, what do you do besides kiss it and put a band-aid on it? Now I get, the, I get it, the kiss is real important. But the body actually heals itself when it's put in the right environment. And photobiomodulation puts our cells in the right environment for them to act, actively begin their own healing process. So to bring all of the science into, into relevant story, and Jeff, you mentioned the, um, um, the case reports as being a low-level, entry-level uh, type of scientific report. It is, however, by those observations of case studies that, in fact, larger um, studies can and do actually evolve. Well, it was only in 2011 and over the course of, of four years, I think it was five years prior to that, that NASER, one of our, one of our prominent photobiomodulation researchers in the country, actually published the first two case reports showing that photobiomodulation actually improved the, symptom, the symptomology of um, two people with traumatic brain injury. And essentially, uh, for brevity's sake here, a 66-year-old who had experienced an MVA, a motor vehicle accident and tra traumatic brain injury seven years earlier, complained that her attention span was, had been reduced significantly. She could only focus for 20 minutes on her computer work after um, 18 treatments, I think it was, with only 60 diodes, 60 little diodes, a, a device at about this, this diameter. After 18 treatments, she was able to focus for another, for three hours or more. She continued her treatments over the course of, and then in, in home care, in the home care setting for years and years to come. She's still highly functional to this day as the report goes. The change in behavior, the changes seems to be that even in an old closed head injury, six and seven and eight years old, a chronic TBI, that when you apply light therapy to the brain, to the skull, it literally wakes those cells up. And here's another case report, and it's, it's only worth noting that these were literally 10 year ago technology. 10 years ago, that technology, because it takes a little bit of time for the studies to get published, only published in 2011. The technology has improved over the course of this past decade. The clinical open protocol studies by NASER actually have improved and increased or continued also. Another study, and here's a, here's a picture of their device of their device, and again, it's 60 diodes in each one of these clusters, so the combination is 120 diodes. So different technologies out there have different, um, different numbers or different amount of LED diodes transmitting that light to the body and through the skull. And I think one of the more important features of NASER's work, not just the few N of two case studies and then an N of 11, that's only 13 people, but as the science has evolved over the past decade, what we're learning and what she said so well is that 
in traumatic brain injury, and she's quoting from other researchers, there is seriously mitochondrial damage at hand. So from the, from the overt to the very subclinical, or to the very um, um, cellular level, it's the mitochondria, folks. That's where our traumatic brain injury is living in its physical sense. And now we've got a, a mechanism, this technology, that literally, it's, 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 it's claim to fame is that light technology triggers photobiomodulation at the cellular level. The receptors on the mitochondria are built to receive light. The receptors are built to receive light. They're called acceptors, photoacceptors. So our body is built to take light in and to heal itself. And so it goes with traumatic brain injury. It's really been over, only over the course of the past, what is it, maybe 10 years, probably seven or eight, that we've begun medically understanding the concept of neuro plasticity, that might be a new word, probably not for many of you. But the fact that the brain can heal itself wasn't in my textbook, it sure wasn't in Doc's textbook. And frankly, it might only now be in the new, new medical and nursing textbooks, but that's the great news here is that the brain is neuroplastic. It's not concrete where once you break it, it's cracked forever. It might feel that way, but it's not. The brain can recover. And I'm going to move through to this, this summary slide of the um, nuclear signaling effect. In other words, what happens when nitric oxide is released from the brain's mitochondria, the brain tissue mitochondria? What happens here? It reduces neuro excito, uh, um, excitation. It increases angiogenesis. In other words, it builds new blood vessels to damaged areas of the brain. Right? It provides, it triggers the brain neurotrophic factors, which means it thereby stimulates the brain's ability, that tissue's ability, to heal itself. It reduces inflammation increases blood flow. It increases the synaptogenesis. In other words, it creates new synapses. And when we create new synapses, we create new ways to think, new ways for the brain to function. So I, I can only tell you that I, I have lived with a commitment since 2004 to do something different for our veterans. That's what has fueled me on a constant quest through all of the complementary and alternative therapies um, to see what it is or what we can do in order to change the outcome of this war for our veterans. That's where my motivation comes from. As I understood traumatic brain injury very little in the beginning, I've grown to understand a whole lot more. So my quest has been to find those technologies that work. So I'm going to challenge you for your own personal reasons and for your clinical reasons to really, really explore this technology. Because I promise you I spent a lot of years looking for something, didn't know what it would be. But I promise you this is something for you to pay attention to. And as Jeff so eloquently said, I love the fact that we're narrow thinkers. I hope I've opened up that alleyway a little bit wider for you. And I'm going to have Doc come up and share with us, well, the spec imaging. Yeah. yeah. Give, you, uh, five more Give yeah. us five. Take okay, because these minutes. these images are really critical. These images will make visible for you what we've both been talking about. Thank you, Jody. You're welcome. Doc. That was great. It's just great. Um, so it's been boring science. We started with the phenomenological. We've started with the brain spec scan. We've, we've talked to you about the mitochondrial dysfunction, which has been shown scientifically to exist. We've shown how studies show that we, we treat mitochondria. Now let's go back up the, the ladder, and we'll finish with this in about one minute here, uh, Jeff. <clears throat> we have done, so the question is begged. I shared with you at the beginning, the woman the woman who had the car accident and her CAT scans were normal, but her SPEC scan was abnormal. So we, so we postulated something must have been going on. When we've done a deep boring dive into what's going on, thank you for your patience with that. But it's really important to understand that the intervention that we're talking about is evidence-based and it works on the known published 
peer-reviewed uh, problems of what's going on at the cellular level in brain injury. So this is a demonstration project. Our company uh, is committed to veterans. So we did a demonstration project on five veterans. And um, we scanned their brains before intervention. And on these spec scans where you see gray, that's normal brain function, where you see green or blue, that's decreased brain function. And then after three sessions a week, for six weeks, we rescan them and look at the difference. Um, this one, this view is, 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 they're not cured, but they're significantly better. And they, all five of the subjects reported, and I'm not gonna go into all each one, but this is just a, one slide to show the effects of photobiomodulation. Photons of light entering the mitochondria, exerting a biological effect to modulate, to change the biology. Uh, and this is uh, one demonstration project. Their symptoms got better. This is a very severe uh, study. This person had a far brain injury, both TBI and hypoxia. So this one was a very difficult uh, patient. This was before uh, six weeks of light therapy. This top row, this is below. Significant improvements in the metabol and the blood flow. And the only right way you can get improved blood flow on a spec scan is if the mitochondria have improved their functioning, if they're generating more ATP and they're metabolizing more. And that was, that was another one. So in summary, um, mild TBI is a very common disease. 10% uh, of them result in permanent brain damage. TBI is a is a disease process characterized by mitochondrial damage, dysfunction, and neuroinflammation. These things progress. Things can get worse over time. Polychromatic light therapy has been shown to improve brain recovery and brain circulation. In SPEC studies, we have just finished a study uh, at CIRFSCAN uh, that we are actually going to be publishing this week on 12 veterans before and after where we were able to show demonstration results. Anyway, we're very excited about this intervention. Uh, we have, we think, we have uh, the Photonic Energy Institute of Greater Iowa here at our meetings. Diana, she's here. Um, and um, you might go visit with her to get more information about it. But um, I know it's just Speaking for Jody and I, we really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you uh, and your organization about one of the newer advances in your field. We hope it fits into your program and that you find it useful. Thank you very much. Thank you.